Hello, my name is Bronan Wilson, and I'm the director of the Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies and the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library. The Clark Library was generously donated to UCLA, and we would like to observe that the Division of Humanities and the College of Letters and Science at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tonga peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and South Channel Islands. It is a special pleasure to welcome you to Whispers and Legacies, a conversation about the Clarks, the Posts, and the Palais. This conversation about family connections and about the complexities of researching and writing family histories has been organized by my wonderful colleague, Rebecca Fenning Marshall. We're grateful to the participants who are joining us today, and I will now hand things over to Rebecca. All right, Bronwyn, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Rebecca Fenning Marshall. I'm the Manuscripts and Archives Librarian at the Clark Library. And as a part of that job, I oversee the Clark Institutional Archive, which we call the Clark Archive. Um, and so I get to work really closely with a lot of the material related to our library's founder. Um, and I'm just really excited to be able to convene this panel of experts uh, today. So before we really begin with our group discussion, I'm going to start by giving sort of a brief overview to the historical people that we're going to be discussing today, because I know that all of the attendees come to this with various levels of knowledge and I want to create, you know, a baseline so that people aren't confused. Um, I've also put together a little family tree cheat sheet, um, which my colleague Eric will be sharing a link to in the chat. So if you get confused while we're talking, um, you can consult it and um, hopefully figure out what we're talking about. Um, after I give my historical overview, each of the panelists will take a turn to talk about their connection and sort of entry point into this history. And then we'll take your questions at the end of our group discussion. Um, so feel free to share those um, in the Q&A module that you'll see a link to at the bottom of your screen. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, because I think it's always helpful to put a face to a name. So I'm going to show you this face first. Um, this is the guy that a lot of our story really starts with. Um, this is William Andrews Clark Sr., one of the great 19th century robber barons of the American West who made an, a fortune in Montana copper mining. He's also, of course, the namesake for our library, though he died in 1925 before the building's completion and he never set a foot inside. Um, he began his career in the Western US as a miner, but quickly realized that the real money was in provisioning miners and in loaning them money. And from there, he was able to build up a huge portfolio that included not just extensive mines um, and sort of their industrial apparatuses in Montana and Arizona, but also newspapers, railroads, and even sugar beet fields and refineries here in Southern California. He also served a single term as US Senator for the state of Montana, and we at the library um, usually just refer to him as Senator Clark, and I'm sure that's what we'll do in this discussion today. So with his first wife, Kate, Clark had four children um, who lived to adulthood, including our library's founder, William Andrews Clark Jr. And then after Kate's death, uh, Clark married Anna Le Chappelle, his former teenage ward, and they had two more daughters, the youngest of whom was Huguette Marcel Clark, who I'm going to talk about next. Huguette was born in 1906, and she spent most of her young life in France and in New York City. She was briefly married when she was a young woman, but after her divorce, she lived a largely reclusive life, um, pursuing her interest in painting, collecting dolls and dollhouses, in, and in photography. So I really like this pairing of images, which is her as a little girl with a camera, and then the other is a Polaroid self-portrait, which is one of many that she regularly shot of herself as an adult. Um, in 1991, she saw saw its skin, skin cancer treatment at a New York hospital and she never left, um, even though she owned several homes. And she voluntarily stayed in private hospital rooms until her death in 2011 at the age of 104. Um, her Santa Barbara home, Bella Squardo, is actually now an arts foundation. And I'm happy to announce publicly, I guess, for the first time um, that her archive of papers, family photos, um, and her photographic work will soon be coming to the Clark Library um, to be a part of our collections, which has been a really long process and I'm very, very excited that it's almost over. <laughs> um, her older brother, Clark Jr., or Mr. Clark, as we usually refer to him at the library, was the founder, of course, of our library. Um, he also founded the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He was born in, 19, in 1877, excuse me, in Montana, and he was educated as a lawyer, though he only worked as one for a very short period of time. 
He began collecting books around 1911, which is about the same time that he moved from Butte, Montana to Los Angeles with his second wife, Alice McManus, and his son, William Andrews Clark III, um, who the family called Tertius. After Alice's death in 1918, Mr. Clark's book collecting became much more serious, um, and he began to focus not solely, but very closely on 17th and 18th century English literature and culture, Oscar Wilde and the turn of the 19th century, um, which are two of our main collecting areas now at the library. After Alice's death, Mr. Clark also met a young man named Harrison Post, who you'll hear about just in a couple minutes, um, who became his longtime secret boyfriend. Um, and in 1924, Clark decided to build the library building that is still our home today. Um, and soon after its completion, he made arrangements with the University of California to gift the library to UCLA when he died. Clark's son, Tertius, died in an airplane crash in 1932, um, though the father and son had been on strained terms for some time before that. Um, and after this point, and because of that estrangement, I think, Clark became increasingly involved in the life of George Palais, the young son of his housekeeper, Martha, who I'll also talk more about in just a minute. Uh, when Clark died at his Montana summer retreat in 1934, he left substantial money to Harrison and George, as well as to other family members and library employees. And of course, the library then also passed uh, into the university's hands. So next is, here's Harrison Post. Um, Harrison Post was born Albert Wise Harrison in about 1897. Um, and after a really sort of unhappy um, family life during his childhood, he was taken in as a young man by a San Francisco woman named Mary Post, who he always called his foster mother. After moving to LA in 1919 to be with Clark, Harrison formally changed his name to Harrison Post and became quickly enmeshed in the LA social scene. Um, though he and Clark's relationship was kept a secret, it was also hiding in plain sight. Um, he's like a ghost <laughs> that's haunting the library even now. And uh, you can see the banner at the bottom of the screen is um, a series of uh, men on our vestibule ceiling that all have his face. And this is just a few of them. There are about 12. Um, when Clark died in 1934, Harrison was, hosp was hospitalized for an ongoing illness. And so his biological sister, who was aptly named Gladys Crooks, um, took this opportunity to have him declared incompetent and placed under conservatorship. Um, and then after she and her husband embezzled and liquidated most of his assets and his Clark inheritance, Harrison ended up um, spending most of the late 1930s in Norway with one of his former nurses. Um, and then when the Nazis invaded Norway as a Jewish American, he was interned in multiple prison camps before finally returning to California in 1945. He found refuge with Mary Post's daughter, Madeline, in San Francisco, and he died there in 1946 while pursuing action against his sister, Gladys. So lastly, here's George Palais. Um, George was nine years old in 1925 when his recently divorced mother, Martha, began working as a housekeeper for Mr. Clark. Though Mr. Clark took an early interest in George um, and paid for his education at a local private school, violin lessons, um, he really began treating him more and more like a surrogate son after Tertius's death. When Clark himself died in 1934, as I said, George inherited a substantial sum of money, um, I believe it was a million dollars in 1934 dollars, um, and he went on to have six children from his two marriages. He spent most of his adult life in Arizona, and he died in 1973. Uh, and I realized that was a lot of people and a lot of names, and many of them are William, um, so it's a little confusing, but that's why uh, there is that, again, that little uh, handout that um, Eric has posted in the chat. So before I um, introduce our panelists, I just wanted to give you a little bit more of an introduction. Um, I wanted to take this moment just to say that I've had the pleasure in my 13 years of working here at the Clark of getting to connect to all of these folks that you're about to meet and getting to connect many of them to one another, which has honestly been one of the most satisfying things that has happened in my career as a librarian. Things like that don't happen very often. Um, when I began working at the Clark, I quickly learned from my colleagues um, and through observation that though the library's archives is very much complete when it comes to book buying and the construction of our building, it contains nearly nothing personal related to Mr. Clark, his wives, his family, his friends. Um, and though colleagues, you know, told me stories and sort of old rumors about Mr. Clark's boyfriend, Harrison, um, he was still a figure that no one knew that much about, apart from his imprisonment during World War II and his presence on the ceiling. Um, so, you know, as an archivist, but also the family historian 
with my own, it, within my own family. I was really intrigued by these archival silences and erasures in our collections. And over the years, tried to dig really deeply into the resources we do have. Things like the guest book for Mr. Clark's summer home in Montana, for example. And then slowly over time, I also met each of today's speakers um, when they came to the library looking for information. And I began learning more and more about the other figures who shaped and influenced not just Mr. Clark's life, um, but the trajectory of the library as a whole. Um, and I think that's really important because until relatively recently, we've always told the history of the library as sort of just the history of William Andrews Clark Sr. who made all this money and William Andrews Clark Jr. who spent a lot of it on books. Um, but we haven't really talked about the other people who made all of those things happen because of course, none of these things happen in a vacuum. It's not just one person that builds a library, for example. So we're really excited here at the Clark Library um, and the center that this event can be the first public one where we can celebrate the other people who helped contribute to the development of this place um, and the man who built it. So I think that's enough from me. Um, I am gonna go ahead and introduce you to our panelists and they'll tell you a little bit more about their work. Our first panelist is Bill Degman. Bill is a Pulitzer and Peabody award-winning investigative reporter, the co-author of the New York Times best-selling biography, Empty Mansions, The Mysterious Life of Huguette Clark and the Spending of a Great American Fortune, co-written with Huguette's cousin, Paul Clark Newell Jr. Bill uncovered the case of the reclusive copper heiress in 2010, as I'm sure he can tell you in a minute, uh, and he documented her life in a series of reports for NBC News and then in Empty Mansions. Um, and currently the, a TV series based on Empty Mansions is in development. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, thank you. It's really good to be with you. And uh, we owe a great debt to the Clark Library, uh, not only myself, but uh, my co-author, Paul, um, who was uh, Uget Clark's cousin, um, had uh, I think moved into your library in essence and uh, uh, was camping out there doing his research and using it as a home base in Los Angeles. And it, it, uh, that kindness um, sharing materials with us is, is really appreciated. Uh, you get a lot of doors slammed in your face when, you, when you're doing a, a biography uh, of a reclusive person whose uh, last published photograph of her published during her lifetime was in uh, 1928. Uh, get Clark was the anti-Kardashian. Um, I'll tell you, uh, uh, you wanna hear how I uh, stumbled into it. It's very simple. I, I was shopping for a home in Connecticut for our family and all we needed was a flat driveway where the girls could ride their bikes, but I got a little bit out of our price range and uh, started looking at the most expensive homes for sale in Connecticut. And uh, one had been marked down from the 30s to the mid $20 million, only 50 acres, a 15,000 square foot mansion. But what intrigued me was that it said um, on the town website that this house had not been lived in since this owner bought it. But it also said that this owner had bought it in 1951. And here we were in 2009. Uh, so I'm not a particularly good noticer, but I have learned to act when I do notice something. So the next morning I was standing at the gate um, of, of uh, Le Beau Chateau in New Canaan, Connecticut. And the caregiver wanted me to know that uh, Mrs. Clark was an excellent employer, though he had not met her. He'd only been there 20 years. The Jaguar in the garage was his. Uh, he, uh, as I was leaving, he said, you know, the house is unfinished, un unfurnished, and no one we don't think has moved any furnishing, furnishings in. Is it? Is it possible that she's been dead all this time? And I didn't know, but I, I wanted to find out and quickly found that she had a nicer home in, in California, in Santa Barbara, also unvisited by her since the early 50s. And she had three apartments on Fifth Avenue in New York overlooking Central Park, unused. Um, now, finding that she was living in a hospital room was the, the simple thing. Um, figuring out how could she, could still be alive was difficult for me to handle. Um, her father was 26 years old when the United States won the Civil War. She was born in 1906 in France. Could she still be alive in the Obama administration? A and she was. Um, I think Uget was at first seen by me, by others as a bizarre recluse, hadn't been out of the house in 50 years. She had a doll collection and make People make a lot of that. If she collected baseball cards, that would not have been an issue. Um, and 
what we what developed over time was that she was an artistic, intelligent, well-read, well-traveled person who could recite poetry in three languages, had played the violin and collected Stradivarius instruments, um, was well-trained as an artist, had shown her paintings, collected impressionists, but just didn't need those things in her daily life and was willing to live where she felt safer in a hospital room with round the clock nursing care and company. Um, she had lived uh, what I think clearly is a mark of the Clark. She had lived a life of books and art and music. Um, and she also was a maintainer of relationships and friends, which is not what you think of in a recluse. Uh, including her ex-husband, and they sent sweet telegrams to each other 50 years later. What a surprise that was in the research. Um, I, I've met up with her cousin, Paul Clark Newell Jr., who was a better investigative reporter than I was. He found her in the Santa Barbara telephone directory, contacted her, corresponded and spoke with her on the telephone regularly for a decade, had tape recordings of some of their calls, and he was really the perfect partner. And um, we're talking here about family stories and family research on stories. And I just wanna interject that notion that Paul's father was writing a book about the great man in the family, the Senator, and he died without finishing that book. And his son, Paul Jr. took that up and got the book finished. That's the key thing. That's the hardest part. He, he got it finished. And he really was the perfect pilot, co-pilot. And I'll just give one example. Just a couple of pages in our book are about the vigilantes in Mo Montana and whether W.A. Clark was there. He said he was involved, saw people, saw a hanging. And Paul was afraid that might not be true. We had pages from W.A. Clark's journal, but maybe he was stretching things. And Paul said, if we get this wrong, the historians in Montana will eat us alive. And he was right. And he spent three weeks making a timeline of, of the journal and making a timeline of the events with the vigilantes to prove that it was possible for W.A. Clark to be in those places. And that's, that's the kind of obsession and care that it takes to, to not write a fictional book which is the easy thing, but to do the hard thing, which is to, to write a nonfiction, a true book. And uh, I just wanted to start by mentioning, Paul died in 16 after our book came out, uh, but he got to see it published. And I, I just, because of the connection between Paul and the Clark Library and his devotion to truth, I, I wanted to mention him right off the bat. Thank you, Bill. Um, our next panelist is Liz Brown. She is the author of Twilight Man, Love and Ruin in the Shadows of Hollywood and the Clark Empire. Her writing has appeared in El Decor, the London Review of Books, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times Book Review, Slate and other publications. She lives in Los Angeles and is descended from the McManus family. Liz. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's so wonderful to be gathered together after so many years and so many different tendrils in this sprawling story, uh, stories. Um, and thank you really, Rebecca, for connecting all of us. Um, none of this conversation wouldn't be possible. The, my book wouldn't be possible. So much wouldn't be possible without librarians um, and specifically you. Um, I came to this because my great grand aunt, uh, Alice McManus was Will Clark's second wife. And, um, and I would hear about Aunt Alice and Uncle Will as a kid growing up and they just seemed these, they were these distant figures, just names that belonged to what's felt like another century. Um, and I knew Uncle Will had been a from this wealthy family, but I didn't know much else. And, um, and, I, and that was really all I knew growing up. And then um, when my grandmother died in 2003, um, and she had been a little girl growing up kind of in the Clark world, um, 
She was named for Alice. Uh, she was a bit of a surrogate daughter in some respects to them. And um, I was searching through her drawers and her things after, you know, the week after she had died, just sort of looking for traces of her. And um, I found this photo um, and was immediately enthralled. And all it said was uh, for Alice McManus with sincere good wishes, Harrison Post, 1922. And nobody knew who Harrison was. No one had any inkling. When I would Google him, I would find Harrison Post offices. Um, but nothing about him. And I just assumed he was a movie star, had been forgotten. Um, and then years later, I was, a few years later, I started researching Will Clark because I knew there were these rumors that he may have been gay. I had come out in my family, I told my parents I was gay and that had been a, a struggle. Um, and so I was really searching for a, the idea that there might be a gay ancestor was really compelling and sort of like a way to stay connected to family or to expand the notion of family. Um, and so I started digging around in Will Clark's story and found this uh, extraordinary document uh, written by his former secretary. Uh, that's a biography, if you want to use the term, for the Clark family. And it, um, is, it's called The Clarks, an American Phenomenon, and it was published in, I think, 1941. And it's a, just a scathing takedown of every member of the Clark family. And, there, and they, there's a lot to take down. There was a lot of corruption. Um, and William Mangum, or Buck Mangum, as he was more commonly known, the author, um, kind of devoted his, his most outrage to Will Clark, who had been his college friend. Um, and I was reading, I had checked it out from the library because it had been hard to track down. And, um, and I was reading it on the subway and it, and it came to the part where Will Clark divides up his estate after his death, or the estate is being divided up after his death in 1934. And the uh, he, Mangum says something like, Will Clark, the bulk of his estate was divided among his perverted disciples, which included George Palais and Harrison Post. Um, that is what, uh, what, how Mangum identified them. And I was just astonished that this photograph that I had felt so connected to and so enraptured with would turn out to be the secret lover of my great grand uncle. Um, and so I continued to dig a, more and the one of the main, the sort of bombshell moment was thanks to Rebecca, who um, when I met her for the first time at the Clark Library and who had pointed to the ceiling and explained that all the naked men had Harrison's face on, on the ceiling. <laughs> um, she also said, you know, there's this woman uh, who I think is a cousin or something, somehow connected to Harrison. And, and she called us or wrote to us, you know, some time ago, and she's interested in this story. You might, you know, here's her email. And so I emailed Sue Lombardi and we connected and, um, the first time we, so I was living in New York at the time, and the first time we connected, she, she was very forthcoming, very friendly, and you never know what, I was always very apprehensive in pursuing this story because I just thought maybe someone isn't going to be that receptive to being asked about their dead gay ancestors. Um, but that did not, she was incredibly receptive and said, you know, I have these journals. If you're ever out in the Bay Area, you should come by and take a look. And so within weeks, I was out in the Bay Area, I was in her house and she, looking through his, Harrison's address book, I think the first name I recognized was Carol Lombard. 
and looking through these journals, which are just extraordinary that he kept while he was in Norway in his scrapbooks and um, and and the sort of mind blowing moment after those mind blowing moments was when she said she was trying to sort of place me and was saying, now you, you're from San Francisco. And I was explaining that I had lived there in high school, but really I grew up in Chico, California, which is North of Sacramento. And, and she said, did your dad teach at Chico State? Uh, which he did. And she said, I've met your parents. I, I know your parents. And she had met them through um, mutual friends. And she said, at the end of this sort of extraordinary encounter, she said, well, I know you, you can take the journals. Um, and so I took them back and um, took them back to New York and started to transcribe them. And I don't know, something that Bill said earlier kind of resonated about sort of trying to connect. Um, I think just maybe the way Paul, maybe talking about Paul's sort of vigilance and seriousness. I, it reminded me of just when I was in the, um, sort of just wanting to stay committed to these people who are gone and trying to do right by them uh, in telling their stories. Um, that one of the things when I was transcribing those journals is I would never, I decided I was never gonna read beyond what I transcribed. And they're very difficult to read. They're very tiny handwriting. Um, but I thought I wanna stay in the exact same tempo that it would take to have written these entries. And so as I was transcribing them, once I kind of was done for the day, I would stop and I wouldn't read ahead because it just felt like there was something about trying to preserve or stay connected to the same tempo um, that this man had made in terms of writing down, um, writing down his daily experiences and thoughts. Um, so, um, and then I will just say, uh, Rebecca also connected me to Stephen who um, was, uh, which our conversations, which have been ongoing over the years, have just been incredibly illuminating. And um, it's kind of amazing to find people who you can, you know, gossip and uh, just have this kind of inquisitive, these inquisitive conversations about people who are gone, you know, and still keep wondering about them. Um, so I'll pause, I'll stop there and pass it on. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, so next, um, you've already gotten a little bit of an introduction to her, but uh, next is Sue Lombardi. Um, Sue is an art historian, an author, an educator from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and she is currently doing Zoom art history lectures, including Essential Art Tour, American Cities, which highlights must-sees in our museums. And as you've already heard, she is connected to Harrison Post. Hi, Rebecca, thank you for that introduction. And honestly, if it hadn't been for you, none of this would have happened. You really put everyone together to contribute to this um, the final book that Liz has um, written, which is so excellent and so well-researched. Um, with respect to how I come into this story, uh, my great aunt, Madeleine Post Starrett, lived in San Francisco, and I eventually ended up inheriting her house. Okay, that's a, a, a later piece. As a young girl, teenager, et cetera, I had heard that my Aunt Maddie's mother had adopted a young man as a teen. And my mother didn't really have any information for me about this. I didn't know anything about him, but I've always been a curious person. And, I was curious and, and that carried on. And then my husband and I moved into the house that Aunt Maddie had lived in. And I, I realized that Harrison Post had actually died in our bedroom, <laughs> that he had come back from Norway and moved in with my Aunt Maddie. 
so then I began to think even more, there's something here that, that I'm not getting. This man must have been a very important part of the family history. So much so that Aunt Maddie was willing to mortgage her house in order to help Harrison Post financially when he came back from Norway. Um, the sad thing is, I still haven't, and Liz and I have done a lot of work on this together. We still don't know the connection between Mary Post, Aunt Maddie's mother, and Albert Weiss Harrison, except for the fact that she, quote, adopted him. Um, but clearly, he was an important part of the family. And in fact, I have some um, artwork in my house that came from Harrison. I realize now I always thought it was from Aunt Maddie, but now I realize it was from um, Harrison. Um, some wonderful things. And on page 19 of Liz's book, um, there's a photo of Harrison with three objects in his hand that he was left with after the sister had taken everything. And one of them is here. This is a watch. And this is one object that was retrieved that he had in his hand. The other is this ring, which actually I had reset, <laughs> but um, it's a sapphire ring that Will had given him and Will had also given him this watch. So it's kind of amazing that these things were left in the Lake Street house. Most importantly, when I inherited the house, you know, being the curious person that I am, I of course went up to the attic and went down to the basement to poke around and see what was there. And that's when in the attic, I found all of the journals and the scrapbooks and the photo albums. And I started going through the photo albums of all these glamorous people and so forth. So I was very intrigued, who is this man? Um, so then we moved to Oakland and I brought all that stuff with us. Um, for some reason, there were so many objects I got rid of in the Lake Street house. It was a huge four-story house and I was moving to a much smaller place, but I brought all of Harrison's you know, material. And then we moved again and I brought it to the house we're in now. So I've always had this incredible curiosity about him and you know, still have the questions as to how did Albert Weiss Harrison meet Aunt Maddie's mother, Mary Post? I do not know the answer to that, and I don't think I ever will. Um, but anyway, that's my connection. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. And I'm just going to, here's the photo that she's talking about. Oh, can you see it? Anyway, um, it was printed in a newspaper document talking about Harrison's legal um, struggles with his sister. Um, so anyway. Lastly, but not definitely not least, um, is Stephen Gruz. Stephen is the grandson of George Palais, and he grew up in Arizona before moving to New York City, uh, where he's had a successful career on Broadway and where he currently lives with this fantastic portrait of his grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, everyone. Um, I want to echo what um, everyone has said about Rebecca and the library, because my, the way I came into it was, so this painting behind me is George Palais. Later on in life, probably in his 40s, because he died when he was, I think, 57 or so. Maybe he's a little bit older. Um, and as a kid, we're talking like kid, you know, seven, eight years old, I would look up at this thing that my grandma had. And first off, whose grandparents had paintings of themselves, right? So I was like, wow, what is that? He was dead already, but by the time I was born, he had been dead for about three years. And I don't know why, I was just always drawn to it. And then in asking questions as a little kid about like, well, where did grandma get her money? Because <laughs> I grew up without money, but grandma had money. And so I was so interested in this, I was told, there was this guy named Mr. Clark, and that's literally the only way my family ever refers to him is Mr. Clark, and they always did. And he left grandpa a million dollars when he was 18 years old and he was gonna adopt it. End of story. You can't end it there. <laughs> what, what is that? And so as a kid, I was fascinated by the money aspect of it, of 
wow, and you were going to adopt an 18 year old? What is that? Well, my grandma ended up moving away from us and, and life happened and things happened. And I went on with my life. As an adult, this story just came back into my head and the internet was a thing. Like, you know, it was just happening. And so I thought, you know what? You can look up people's names. If this Mr. Clark guy had so much money, maybe there's some information on him. And so sure enough, the library comes up and I'm like emailing my, my relatives going, did you know this? There's this whole library in California. And they're like, oh, we didn't know. And so, and my grandma had died by that point. So it was literally just his children, my aunts and uncles. And they didn't, they didn't know. So I reached out to Rebecca and for me, all of a sudden, like little, little things started happening where Rebecca would say, here's your, you know, I remember being shown, you mentioned the, um, the log book of uh, the summer home. And you said, um, here's your, your grandpa's signature in the log book. And I was like, wow, where, where is his mom? And I was told, to be honest, she probably wouldn't be in this because she was the help. And so just getting my mind wrapped around all that, which, oh, if I forgot to mention, so George's mother was Mr. Clark's housekeeper. And she was from France, like full on straight up born in the Pyrenees mountains, did not have an education past like probably um, elementary school. And she had been married, married and that marriage went south. She had had two children. The first child um, we were told drowned basically in a bucket of water. And then they had the second child, which was George. And then she divorced him shortly after. And that all happened in San Francisco. And then they moved down. No idea how she got hooked up with Mr. Clark. And so that all happened, everything that uh, Rebecca ha has already said. And so I started thinking, well, what can I find out? What can I find out more? And, and so what I've learned is that I wish I would have had Liz's book, and I've told her this, when I started looking into everything, because it's Liz's book would have filled in a lot of the background and a lot of these questions about, like I remember hearing the Harrison Post story when I was at the library and going, oh my God, that's amazing too. And thinking, no, no, I can't, I can't focus on that. I just have to focus on my grandpa. And so it's been interesting that Liz's story has come back into my life where I was like, oh, let me learn about Harrison. And I will be straight up honest with you, with our audience, everyone. I have no answers, just like uh, Sue just said. I'll never have answers. My mom is constantly saying, we're never gonna know, but that doesn't stop me from asking the questions because I have found for myself by asking the questions, this portrait becomes more of a person because I've lived, I know more now, I can understand things. And then I put what I know into that head. You know, it's very similar to the glass menagerie where uh, her husband is another character in the play, but all he is is a portrait on the wall. And that's how I've looked at this portrait of George. You know, I, I see it every day when I leave my, my apartment and, and I sometimes just look at it going, you know, would, would you probably be pissed that I'm looking so far into these things that you probably are like, no one needs to know that. Yeah. But guess what? <laughs> He's dead. And that's what I kept telling to, to Liz when we were talking about this is I look at the people in this story as characters in a play, a movie. They're all dead. No, no one's going to, you know, I'm not trying to get money from anyone. Um, sorry. Like, I'm not trying to get money. I'm not trying to find it. I, I just want to, there's something here and there's a lot for me on my side of the family. I believe that there's 
a lot of pain that happened and maybe not the pain that you may think if you know the Clark story and we'll we'll hopefully talk about that later on but but I think by if for me by asking all these questions and bringing my family who never questioned George they never asked about who's Mr. Clark it's actually brought some weird closure to them in their lives I feel so I'll just sort of leave it at that so we can start getting into these each of these people but you know, while you're looking at this, that's George when we refer to him. All right, well, thanks, Stephen. Um, so now we're gonna move on, have a little bit more of a discussion. Um, I feel like you all mentioned so many things that I hope we can talk about quite a bit more. Um, but I thought, I thought I would start, this is maybe mostly for Liz and Bill, um, but talking about how you approach a story when, you have sort of a lack of available primary source material um, and and or the material that you have, like the Buck Mangum book that you mentioned, Liz, like what you do when the evidence you do have is at least partly unreliable. Like what, how do you figure out what the grain of salt is that, I don't know, <laughs> how do you, how do you figure out how to work on these kinds of projects when there are so many holes and then, um, you know, sometimes you stumble across information like meeting Sue, but it really is a lot of serendipity. Um, yeah, how do you approach a project or how did you approach these projects? Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in quickly and say that um, there was a point when I was considering how can I get away with fabricating just to try to fill in gaps or just to try to like give some color. Um, I didn't, uh, and the editor would not have allowed that. But, um, and then there was a period when I was going to inject more of my story in the kind of meta search of it into it, and then decide in a way, again, because I just felt there was so much, on so many gaps. There was a period when I was gonna write a lot more about Oscar Wilde, uh, who appears in, in the book a little bit. Um, and again, that was not necessarily because the story demanded it, because but because I was trying to kind of fill in the time, you know, fill in for what I couldn't explain. Um, and I think I, what I, I ended up just sort of having to deciding that I would disclose from the beginning that that one of these sources was unreliable and just not uh, just be transparent about that. And in the book itself, I do try to signal when I'm relying on that document to say, all right, remember, this is coming from a person who can't entirely be trusted. Um, at the same time, I believe much of Buck Mangum's book is the result of what, what was intended to be a lawsuit in which he was going to expose uh, Will Clark and Harrison's relationship. And so I think there is actually, I do think he had compiled a lot of evidence. Um, and so there are things I do actually trust him about to some degree. Um, and, and, I, and in a way, I mean, I think what the, the sort of having the, the gaps meant was, um, you know, one of the things I couldn't dramatize was really the intimacy between Will and Harrison because they, made a very definite decision to not leave personal traces, except for, say, the ceiling of the Clark Library. You know, it, if you know where to look, you see it's there in plain sight. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a struggle to sort of realize this story isn't, I thought I was gonna get to reclaim a gay love story it's it's there in you know in the margins a bit but that's not what it's about because there was so little material it's sort of just trying to kind of put this this erased man back into the world um is what is what it ended up being and for you bill i mean i know the yeah. situation's a little bit different but it still is this i don't know you mentioned yeah. like doors being slammed in your face because researching someone reclusive is a, 
a puzzle on its own. <laughs> you know, Paul and I talked about this difficulty of having unreliable information and having gaps. I, I think we need more truthful nonfiction books like Liz's. Um, there are, I'm not sure everybody understands that there are a lot, a lot of books on shelves in libraries that say they're nonfiction books and have made up information in them. There, there's a book uh, written by a journalism professor um, that one of the characters is Anna Clark. That's W.A. Clark's second wife. So W.A. Clark Jr.'s stepmother. Um, you get its mother. And there's a, a scene in this book where uh, she's uh, starting to be sponsored by the senator, the wealthiest man in Butte. She's living in her mother's uh, boarding house. And there's a conversation between her mother and young Anna, a teenager. She's portrayed as a little younger than she was in this book about um, money and sex and some trade-offs that might happen between those. And where did that dialogue come from? There's a footnote, the footnote takes you to an article that has the address they lived in in Butte, but not that dialogue. That dialogue was made up. And Paul and I talked about how we viewed this as a lack of faith in the reader. In regard to Uget's story, we thought that the reader's speculations would be better than ours. What effect did it have on her to grow up in the largest house ever built in New York City that the father would fling open on Saturday afternoons so the public could tour the five art galleries and she's a quiet, uh, shy girl. Well, what effect would it have that there were newspaper cartoons in New York City uh, newspapers about Uget Clark when she was a teenager? She was a character in newspaper cartoons. Or about um, what effect would it have that her father had such a disreputable reputation from his attempts to steal elections? Um, we thought that the reader speculations would be better than ours and that it would be robbing the reader of some of the fun Part of the fun would be speculating, and why do they need to read our lame speculations? I, I also thought that it was uh, important for, for us to, to admit when we didn't know. A reader ought to be able to, you know, a maxim in journalism is that I was raised with is that, is that we know what people say and what they do. We never know what they think or feel or believe. So, we're careful in how we say that. I wouldn't say you're a devout Catholic. How would I know that? I would say that you say that you're a devout Catholic. That's a fact. You see that important distinction. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a subtle thing. It may seem like a stickler's point, but it's a maintaining of a book that other researchers later can rely on. That's the most important thing. You fix your mistakes. And, you, and you, you try to leave an honest trail for those who come after you. The, the Mangum Buck was a puzzle for us because you know he was Clark's uh, junior's college buddy and worked for him and with him and worked for the family and was privy to a lot of gossip. But it's also clear that a lot in the book is not true. And I'll just give you one example about W.A. Clark Jr., uh, the senior, the senator. Everybody, you don't have any trouble finding online people quoting him saying, I never bought a man who wasn't for sale. Nobody's ever written a book about uh, the senator without putting that quote in. And Paul and I had to explain, you know, there's no proof he ever said that. It seems doubtful that he ever said that. We're going to tell you that quote because it's so colorful. And we quoted Mark Twain. Mark Twain said about the great man in the family, W.A. Clark Sr., he is as rotten a human being as can be found anywhere under the flag. There is no man who helped to send him to the Senate who did not know that his proper place was in the penitentiary. Well, the, Mark Twain did say that. But the only way, honest way to convey that quote is to point out that Mark Twain went bankrupt. And Mark Twain was saved from bankruptcy by Henry Huddleston Rogers, who was Standard Oil. W.A. Clark was in business and copper mining in Montana and wanted to be in the Senate. And his opponent in politics and in mining was a man named Daly, Marcus Daly, who sold all his businesses to whom? Henry Huddleston Rogers. In other words, this man that Mark Twain was talking about was the opponent in business of the man who saved him from bankruptcy. And he made these remarks at a private dinner where he was invited, he was standing, he was standing next to Rogers when he made these remarks. 
And it stuck to you. If Mark Twain gets you, you were your God. But so as a biographer, you can't steer around these things, but it, the only honest thing to do is to explain how they happened and what you know and what you don't know. And, and uh, that may feel like, well, we just don't want our peas and corn to touch on the plate, but it's not that kind of stickler. It really is important to give the reader a, re a roadmap so they can tell where things lie on the spectrum from sure to doubtful to conflicting information and just where there are gaps. The reader should be able to place every line of your book on that spectrum. Um, so I want to, one other thing that I really want to make sure that we talk about, so I'm going to ask this next, um, it's just about how these historical people that we've talked about, how you, how you think <laughs> they thought about their legacy and history, um, and how that's sort of reflected in, you know, the record keeping that exists or, or not, um, and how you think sort of about your role in the same, which Bill was sort of alluding to, um, and I guess, a, you know, a sub question for this that I, for many of the other historical people that we're talking about, I feel like I have a hypothesis about what how they thought about legacy. I don't have one for Senator Clark um, because I feel like he lived in this time where there were all of these, you know, gilded age rich families who were, you know, they put their names on lots of buildings, they have foundations, they whatever, you know, you know their names, but that he was so not interested, but with the exception of his artwork that went to the Corcoran Gallery, he was so not interested in that at all to the extent of when I die, you can tear down my house, like you can move out. Um, so I'm just curious, like what, after spending, I don't know, a lot of time with him, like what, what do you think he thought about legacy or did he not care? We just know that, you know, he, he clearly was a proud man. He was vain. Um, he had ruined his reputation. You know, you can't think of anybody in today's world. Try to think of a figure uh, comparable to W.A. Clark. Can you think of anybody who lives in the tallest tower on Fifth Avenue, who's a wealthy man, who wants to go into politics, who's accused of stealing an election and then accused of trying to do it again? No, I see you, Sue. I see you're, you're smiling, but you're not thinking of the right person because W.A. Clark didn't inherit his money. They're not at all similar. But the, the, the Clark left very little legacy of that sort. I mean, he named a town in Arizona after himself, Clarkdale, the company town. He, he wanted to ensure that the Clark collection of his art had his name on it at the Corcoran and the family paid for a building for it. He didn't build any sort of legacy of the Rockefeller or Vanderbilt that you're referring to. No trust, he just left the money to his children. Um, W.A. Jr. did a better job Will Clark did a better job founding the Philharmonic and, and helping pay for the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, Uget will turn out to have done the best job because she's left her main asset, a $100 million property in Santa Barbara to an arts foundation. And uh, they've applied for a permit for public tours of that great home. And within the next year, you should be able to buy a time ticket and go in. And at some point it will be an art museum between the Getty and Hearst Castle, you'll stop in Santa Barbara and go to Bellas Guardo. Um, but W.A. Clark did not seem very interested in justifying himself to later generations. I'll just quote one thing he said um, when he retired from the Senate. You know, Clark spent most of his time as a, as a senator fighting Teddy Roosevelt's environmental reforms because they cost him money. A national forest means timber you can't mine and to, to cut down and put in your mine. And he said the, the demands of a utilitarian age demand that we use all the resources available to us. See, we don't have any choice. It, the times demand it. And he said, those who come after us can well take care of themselves. Now, that's not a very popular opinion today about environmentalism or con conservation, but I, I, I think it, it, it does convey something about uh, how he would have responded to, to, to criticism. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that does make a lot of sense. And I, um, I'm sorry to pick on you, Bill, but I feel like the follow-up then is, 
I feel like um, you get is very different. Really? I don't in, in her documenting of herself. Um, and I'm just curious what if you think. I don't know. I mean, she left a lot behind. A lot of it is very disorganized, but it is, it's hard to not see it in some ways as a reaction to her parents not leaving a ton of papers and stuff. And I'm just, I don't know. I'm curious what you think about that. Or if you, well, she, she, she left a lot of, um, um, she left self portraits of herself, for example. Um, she left all her correspondence that she received and copies of some that she sent. And uh, I don't know if she thought anyone would ever be interested or have any reason to go to go through that. She might have thrown some things away. Uh, all of you should clean out your attic. We can learn a lot about you from your attic, what you valued, what you created, what you uh, what you you kept and aspired to. Um, the there, there was a, a family trait of throwing away the letters, the incriminating old, you know, the love letters. And um, yet, seem to keep, you know, if, if you die with 20,000 pages of correspondence in French, for somebody to translate and go through, much of it will be mundane, but maybe there'll be something in there of interest. Um, she, she didn't uh, seem interested in celebrity or didn't seem to focus much attention on the ramifications of it. I think she had no concept that she would ever be well known. Um, that was just a, an accident. And, uh, but if she, for example, had not wanted us to see her paintings, quite beautiful seven foot tall paintings of Japanese figures and self portraits, uh, th then she, you know, she knew what to do with them. Um, and so uh, we've seen some and others will eventually be on, on display. I think she was proud. She showed that she was proud and had good relationships with the family. We know she had a good relationship with Will, her half brother, and um, was very proud of her dear mother, dear father, and her late sister, um, and seemed to, to not to be sad at all, but to be to, to have cherished memories of her father's house on Fifth Avenue, her mother's house in Santa Barbara, and spent only forty to eighty thousand dollars a month keeping the Santa Barbara house in perfect condition for sixty years, so it would be in good shape when she finally gave it away to somebody. You know that that, that tells you what she cherished. Uh, that's a family legacy. Uh, so I, I don't think she was shying away from putting the family name on thing, but but she didn't have an Instagram account. Um, what do you, would Harrison have had an Instagram account? Would he have been like tweeting excerpts from his diary? He, I think he would have had a private one with, you know, his celebrity friends, I think. He, I don't, he had no desire from what I gathered for common fame, you know, for popular fame, but I, he definitely, you know, he was the person who threw parties for famous people, famous pe he was famous among famous people. He was someone who was known, he was in that, you know, known for having these fabulous writing parties out in the Palisades and hosting people. Um, I think that that was a type, I think he belongs to a sort of type of aristocracy um, that we don't often identify in America, uh, but I, it certainly exists. Um, that would probably be more legible if he had been, say, British, where um, he'd be known to other nobility. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I think the journal keeping, I don't, I suggest a desire for some kind of leaving a trace, perhaps just in your own life. Um, the scrapbooks, he was not a meticulous, he was not meticulous with his artifacts. They're very, disheveled um, in a way, but but he definitely wanted, was a record keeper, you know, and he kept the, when he, uh, there's also a scrapbook that keeps um, a lot of clippings, certainly about the uh, scandal with his sister at the end of his life. And he also kept a lot of clippings about aristocrats in exile, 
which I found fascinating, which I, I read as he felt a connection to those stories, to people, to uh, princes or duchesses or countesses who've been displaced from the war or other, other reasons. And Stephen, I feel like you touched on this a little bit, um, or maybe that was earlier. Anyway, what I mean, what about your grandfather and your family? Is did you have a sense that George kept things, or do you think? Well, what's interesting is we actually um, uh, we actually have a a album that my grandma put together uh, for. George was like a gift of things that he had kept from that time. So all of a sudden there were these photos of Mr. Clark and George when he was, you know, nine, 10 years old wearing a little military outfit and they're outside and, and then pictures of him at, uh, at, at the lodge in Montana. And I remember just looking through this going, what, this is so cool. Like what is happening here? And I don't think George himself would have intended, like I need to, because again, he did not talk about this man to his children. His children who, if you know George's story, like the, the you know, his mom worked for, for Mr. Clark and his dad was like out of the picture. Well, he ended up getting to know his father later on in life. And, but it's not like he was, that, that even Grammaire, Martha, she never talked about Mr. Clark, except going and we'll talk about it later, but she like would clean the mausoleum. So it's like these weird things. It's like, no, this is just what we do. There wasn't the instilling of this is important to be, to pass on. You know, George enjoyed having the money, I believe, because there's a quote that I was told growing up that he used to say, if you can't travel first class, don't go at all, which is fascinating coming from someone who looks like this, <laughs> like he's wearing work clothes, you know, and he did not have, like his family was not opulent. They did not live in a huge mansion, but he had money. And he, again, what I believe learned from Mr. Clark is he knew where to use the money. He wasn't going to let the money stand in the way of him getting what he wanted, but he had those roots of the, you know, the housekeeper's son. So he knew like there was this weird balance between the two, but I do not believe that there was a legacy. And that's why I have so many questions. And I think it's fascinating because why wouldn't you have a legacy? Why wouldn't you, if this happened to me, I would be telling everyone. You know, so yeah, that's that's just my feeling. Um, so can you tell, I mean, you touched on it, but can you just tell the story about the mausoleum? So if anyone's been to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, the Clark Mausoleum, beautiful place. I knew nothing about it until I started doing the research. And when I started doing the research, I was like, you guys, there's this mausoleum. And my aunts and uncle and my mom would be like, yeah, Grammaire used to take us there when we would go visit her in California and she would clean it. She would literally clean the mausoleum, which is fascinating because Mr. Clark had been dead how many years? I mean, this was at least in the, in the 50s. So Mr. Clark's been dead a while, yet she is still as the housekeeper going to the mausoleum and making sure it is clean. And that is her purpose. And it was interesting because when you guys, uh, when I went and visited the library and you guys arranged for me to go inside of the mausoleum because it's only open once a year, um, it's beautiful inside. And I remember saying to uh, the lady from the, the cemetery, this place is beautiful, people should see it more. And she said, if we had it open all the time, it wouldn't be beautiful because it would, people would be tracking in all the time. And she said to me, it's a private family mausoleum. And when I told her the story about my grandmother, she said, 
our records show that there's only one other key out there than the key that she had. And I thought that was fascinating that somewhere this little French lady who was a nobody is like, oh yeah, I have the key to that mausoleum. And she would go in there while the kids would just sit on the steps outside and they would just sort of like, okay, we're hanging out at the cemetery while Grammaire cleans the mausoleum. And that's a vivid memory for each of my aunts and uncles that they do remember at some point visiting her, she would say, oh, we're gonna go you know, on our rounds, we're cleaning the mausoleum. So it's an interesting thing how that has stuck with her her entire life. And I think it's really interesting that you say it was a really vivid memory for all of you know her grandchildren going with her to watch her sweep the mausoleum. But at the same time, it wasn't, you had to remind them that they had been there. Does that make sense? So I'm just kind of curious. I don't really know the answer to this at all. I don't know if there is an answer, but what, what do you, I mean, I think Sue hinted at it when she said incredible curiosity about Harrison, but what do you think it is that makes you, I don't know, be the preserver of these stories, that these stories matter, <laughs> that they matter find, to you, that you would carry around these trunk, this, this trunk right. of stuff from house to house. Um, you know, I don't want to know, I don't want to say makes it you special, but I mean, really it does. No, I think, um, I think, what do you think it is? <laughs> well, I think there was so much I mean, I remember asking my mother about Harrison and she said, we don't talk about him. And uh, so of course, then I'm even more curious, you know, why aren't we talking about him? What, what's going on? And then when Aunt Maddie and her husband and Harrison and the lawyer went down to Mexico City to confront this sister, you know, I was asking mom more about that and, um, you know, she just, it was always the same thing. Don't know, don't want to know, uh, family secret. And um, so of course I had to hold on to all of that for that, probably for that reason, because it was such a mystery. And eventually I was hoping to, to figure out the answers. Unfortunately, I haven't, but um, yeah, it was really important to hold on to it. Plus, looking at the photos and all, I mean, they're, they're just all these fabulous looking people. So, of course, then you're curious. And then after reading the clips in the newspaper about the party when he got so sick and, you know, anyway, it was the mystery of it all that, that um, forced me to keep everything. I'm going to jump in because there's something Stephen said early on about pain that struck me. And I, Stephen, you can say more about that, but I must wonder, um, I mean, I think it, it, precisely what Sue just said about the moment someone says you're all ears and you're forever going to want to know and unravel or, you know, don't go into that room. You're going to go into that room. Um, but I do wonder, I, it, it's only just occurring to me now, is that there might be another level, which is one of the reasons people, you know, don't want to talk about family secrets is because they dredge up pain, right? Uh, or can't, or that is the fear, pain and shame. And maybe, you know, there are people have so many different, in families, people occupy so many different roles, but maybe there are people who can actually tolerate the pain in a way, or really, or like, and not, I think I had a little bit of a kind of like avenging impulse in the beginning of like, I'm gay and I want to find this, you know, excavate this gay history. And I don't feel like that's what powered me at the end of it. You know, that that's very different, at a very different, I came to a very different place with that, but do sort of feel like that that there is this kind of feeling of these things need to be excavated in a way to release the pain. Maybe if you're the kid who, or the member of the family who's like, I can do it. I can put on the, you know, 
fireproof gloves and grab the flaming object. Or I don't know, you know, I could leap into a, another metaphor right now, but I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's something that uh, you and I have talked about before, Liz, where it's, you know, is it that we are, and I'm speaking of myself as a family historian in my own family, not as a librarian, but are, is it that we are the only people that can do this or that we claim that role first? And now the other people that are also interested are like, well, it's already their deal. Um, so I feel a little bad you know, pushing other people's interest and legacy to the side in favor of my own. Um, I actually think this this has been so. I'm fascinated to hear Sue. I've never um, uh, spoken with her before, but to hear literally everything she just said, I'm like, oh yeah, I know, I know. I've been I've been there. I've just been there with this different person, and now now the next level I had after reading Liz's book was, wait. George was still in California when all of those new news articles came out about what happened to Harrison Post. And George lived in, in um, uh, Los Angeles, like he lived in Santa Barbara. No, uh, no, Los Angeles, I think it was. And I'm like, he would have seen that. He would have seen that. And what did he think of like this guy who had been a part of this other part of his life is now coming back and this had happened to him because when George got all of his money, people were like, oh, let's go after this child. And he had to like go into hiding for like two years because so many people were trying to get money from him. So it's sort of fascinating that, you know, 800 years later, the two descendants are coming together in a forum to be like, oh my God, I had the same question, you know? So I, I just, I enjoyed that. You know, the money I think is the forgotten part of this. You know, we all have, all our families have secrets, as you've said, and uh, uh, my mother's sister, my aunt just wrote a, a book during the pandemic. She wrote down all her memories for her grandchildren. And there's one line, uh, a beautiful car pulled up to the house. A man got out very well dressed. My, my mother sent me back into the house. That was my mother's real father, but that's another story. Well, where in the book is this other story? It's not in the book, right? But we have the letters. We know about this other family. It's the money that warps it though, I think. You know, I, I went to high school at a prep school and lots of uh, sons of Coca-Cola bottlers or bankers and others. And you know, they're not the ones on Facebook. My high school friends are all on Facebook but not the five or 10 guys who are the well, either that or they blocked me, but you know, they don't, they're, they're, you're, you're trained just as you get was trained about the threat of kidnapping. And um, just as they limited their relationships uh, with people who they knew, uh, family attorneys and their children, family, uh, uh, people you're paying and therefore people who owe you an, uh, a debt of, of confidentiality. In a way, that's how W.A. Jr., how Will Clark really was straying in L.A., not just by being gay, but by, but by being reckless in a way, by having the possibility that somebody like Mangum, his former friend, could write a tell-all book. And, but none of that would have happened if it, if it weren't for the money, because that motivates people to, to care and it motivates people to want to get a piece of it, to sue, to, to want to be bought off or to be usually to want to be included, to, to, to want to be a, 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 your friend and get paid. Well, I still feel like I have a ton of things that I want to ask, but I am looking at the clock and I can see it's already 3.15. Um, so actually someone sent me a question, um, Anna Chen from the Clark sent me a question that I was going to ask. So we'll ask this as our first Q&A question. Um, and attendees, if you have any questions, if you can put them in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat, um, then we can see them and answer them. Um, but this first question is, uh, I was fascinated by Stephen, Sue's, and Liz's comments about what it meant to them to search for answers about the past, and how has that experience affected how or whether you document your own life and what you'll leave behind? Uh, 
uh, wants to take that? I'll, 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 head list. I'll start by saying, well, I think I was a better record keeper before I had an iPhone. And I imagine this little device, I let this little device record everything. I think I was better at keeping a journal that I've, that in a way that has been more destructive to record keeping than anything else. Um, I do think about the journals I do have, like, do I want to leave those behind now that I've, you know, transcribed someone else's? Um, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, it, do, it does make, actually, I do, it does make me want to be a better journal keeper, uh, which I'm, I'm not um, as much as I used to be, just because it does feel like a way to hold on to your experience and um, to write it down. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. What are other, other, what do other people think? For me, it had a huge effect um, because I actually ended up writing a, a family history for my grandchildren because you know, I so lacked in all the answers from my past. So I wanted to make sure that they gathered as much information as they could about the family. So I have this nifty little book and I hope that they read it before I die because, uh, you know, that's, that's the problem. You come up with all the questions and oops, it's too late. She's gone now. So <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think, uh... I was shocked how much it did um, impact me because I don't think anyone is gonna care what I did, but there's the little part of me about what if one of my brother's kids is like, wait, we don't really know Uncle Steven that well. And cause I have to say, I've had sort of like a fabulous life in New York city. My family lives in Arizona. And, and I'm not that close with my family, but I see them all the time. But that doesn't mean someone won't um, be interested. And during COVID, when I was looking at that clock going, it is gonna be a while till I get back to work, I started keeping a daily journal of what I did every single day and what I was feeling and what I was at whatever. And I'll stop it when I do go back to work, but. I don't know. I think I, that is all stems from this story of of like someone may you know it's the that whatever that last song is in Hamilton where they say who will tell your story, you know. And I want to be able to give the people who, if anyone wants to tell my story, otherwise, throw it in the trash, you know. At least at least I tried. So if someone wanted to, I, the one piece of advice I'd give for the people who. Uh, on behalf of all of us who uh, want to write your history is throw away what you want, but print out all the photographs and take a Sharpie and write on the back of the photograph who's in the photograph and when and where it was. Please do that. Uh, you'll save us thousands of hours. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, our next question is from Ari, and she wants to know, um, this question is for each of the panelists, and she wants to know if you were addressing strangers who came to the Clark for a tour, because she gives strangers Clark tours of the Clark, um, what would you want for them to know about George, you get, and Harrison? What would be like your, I don't know, elevator pitch during a, during a tour? Liz, are you going to take this? I'll start. I'll go. I mean, I, I'm really going to crib from the first time I met Becky when I uh, when she pointed up to the ceiling and said, "They're all different bodies, but they all have the same face." It's Harrison, and then pointed across the street to the white-walled co Spanish colonial villa that is now a Zen center, and said that was Harrison's home where he had across the street. Um, so I would first visually place them. And then I might point to the drapes and the carpet because I believe he picked them out. Um, he picked out the original ones. But he picked out the originals. Um, those would be the things I would point to um, for Harrison. Oh, 
I would also tell them about the ghost on the second floor. <laughs> yes, we think the ghost is Alice. That's a different program. We're not going to talk about ghosts. <laughs> but you know, I think the fact that that uh, do we believe it? Is it correct that that Will's secretary, W. A. Junior's secretary, destroyed his papers and letters after after he died? Were we confident that that's what happened? Um, I, I mean, I kind of think that it's a combination of the, yes, she destroyed things because she wanted to protect him. And then I also think that it is totally possible that librarians at the library in the 50s who got rid of, you know, Mr. Clark's non-scholarly books also were like, we don't need this crap. Like, why do we need these letters from Alice? This is not important to the story of the library. Um, whereas it, now it's like, oh man. So I think it's a combination of what protecting protecting Mr. Clark, but also like what history is Im important. Um, and when it's women and queer people, it's not, it was but not. I, I, yeah, yeah, but I, I would, I would uh, say that for me, that was the most, one of the most fascinating parts of the first tour I took there at the Clark was this idea of what we don't know, because, because that you get that twinge of desire to know that um, and, and the, the sense of loss and you may never know so much. It's um, that I think that pointing out the gaps is as important as pointing out. You, there, you have to have a lot of humility about writing a, a biography or trying to tell your family story because it feels to me um, undoable. It feels to me, uh, I mean, it's impossible, right, Liz? It's impossible to write somebody else's story. You can't do it. And so we have to do it. But it feels like learning to drive a car with a stick shift and you're parked on a hill, stopped on a hill and someone's pulled right up behind you. Yeah. And you, and you, um, uh, the trick is to, is to move forward and not get hit in the intersection, but also not roll back into the person behind you. More bad things can happen than good. And you're ill-equipped. You, you have uh, two feet and there are three pedals. Um, trying to write someone else's story who's a real person, if you're gonna show respect to them. Yeah. And, and so you have to admit what you don't know. And, and it's tempting to think you know, because you have so much information, you have photos, they were written about, you have the stories of other people. Often you have a lot of material you can push on the gap. But the break has to be, we don't know why she or he made these choices. Yeah. We, we, we don't know how they first met. They didn't tell us that. There are just so many empty spaces. And we chose, Paul and I chose in Empty Mansions to just treat that as, hey, it's a mystery story. There's parts we don't know. And when you get to the end of the book, there will still be parts you don't know. And we're not going to make them up. And that's the fun. I don't know if that's just a grand rationalization. Uh, but that think, felt more satisfying to us. Yeah. I think what you said about trusting the reader feels a, re a really important thing to note to reiterate here and that in some ways because I felt this story of Harrison Post it comes to a sad end it doesn't have a triumphal sort of and I don't mean triumphal of good over bad but of closure and, um, and it wasn't until I finally was hearing from people who'd read it that it existed in the world and people had read it and I realized like Oh, this is the closure. These people know are carrying the story now. Like they know the story about George. They know, you know, like they know, and that in which is different than say in a novel. It's but it's it's sort of like the reader, the reader fulfills it for you. And you don't get to be, you know, I had the good fortune of hearing that from some friends, but you don't you rarely get to be with the reader when they finish your book, you know. I think authors always tell themselves that story. The, the narrator in All the King's Men says, uh, they never lived until our telling gave them life. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's how authors feel about what they're doing. <laughs> Insurance salesmen probably have a similar story. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm still muted. Okay. Um, just taking a look if there's any other questions. Joseph Ryan wants to know where's the key um, to the mausoleum. <laughs> we have no idea. Don't know. No idea. There, that, there you're kidding. Like, I would if 
I would have it and I'd be hanging out in there all the time. There, I mean, Hollywood Forever does have one, um, but, and they do open it, I believe maybe once a year for a special event, but otherwise it is only supposed to be family members. Um, the mosaic yeah. tiles in there are spectacular. But um, we, uh, Bill talked a little bit about the Kardashians at the beginning. He mentioned how Kika was not a Kardashian. Do you want to just tell the story really quickly, Stephen, about how you uh, caught the Kardashians in the mausoleum and sent me a Facebook message about it? <laughs> I don't. I don't watch the Kardashians. I happen to be watching something on that show or on that channel, and all of a sudden they're like doing this promo. And I remember I full on like videoed the television screen and I sent it to you because the people at the, the cemetery were very adamant about you're technically not family because Mr. Clark never actually uh, adopted George. And you guys were like, yeah, but we can, it, this is okay. But like, it was sort of like they were tight because they only open it on, I think it's the day of the dead. Um, and, and they were really, and that's why I said it, this shouldn't be seen by everyone. And she's like, it's a private family mausoleum. And I was like, okay, well, fine. And I understood that. And then all of a sudden, you know, like a year or two later, there's Kim Kardashian crawling on top of the, the, you know, the actual, uh, coffin, not coffins, whatever they're called, the or marble or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, no, if you're going to treat this place as, you know, so it just made me angry because, you know, it was like a sellout in a sense. And, and, and I don't know, I, who knows if Mr. Clark would have liked that or whatever, but I sort of liked the idea of, I sort of like the idea that it's really private unless you know that one day to go, you, it's, it's sort of like everything else with the Clark story about, yeah, no, you don't get to know it. Only a certain people knew it and certain people were aware of it. And you can, you can look in from the outside and wonder what's it like in there but you don't know unless you actually are able to go in. And so that was my beef with the Kardashians crawling all over everything. Cause I was like, no, this is a beautiful space. And you're all of a sudden treating it like it's, you know, just your, your living room couch for television. But I do like, I do like that it creates this parallel with you and your great grandmother that you are also a protector. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma, oh. Grammar's gonna have to clean that after you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully her ghost is not haunting the Muslim. Right, right. Um, well, I think that might be it for questions. Um, I'm going to say know? we've mentioned we've mentioned that manga book a lot. For anyone who does find it either on, I mean, I have a copy that I found on eBay years ago. It's actually signed by him. And it, it's oddly, it's printed upside down, which I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, anyone who reads that, take it with a grain of salt, as we've said, because there are things we have not gotten into, like salacious things that were, that that he says were done to George and everything. and and. We don't know that. It's interesting to think that may have happened, but there's a whole nother thing. Try to think, well, what if that didn't happen and it was something else? But so for those of you listening who may read that book, don't get me wrong. It is trashy as trashy can be. And it is like, you just want to eat everything it's saying. But remember, it was as my aunt said, when I said, wait, there's this book and grandpa's mentioned in this book. And she goes, oh my God, try to get a copy of it because you always want to talk to the disgruntled employee because they always are going to spill the dirt, you know? And so remember, this is a disgruntled person who's, who's trying, so don't necessarily take it all as truth. Yeah, and I think if you do read it, um, I posted in the chat, I thought it used to be on Google Books. It is. It was like published by Vanity Press originally, so there were not a lot of copies. Um, so your best bet is to find it in a library. Um, uh but yeah you the mean the meanness comes through it's mean yeah um it doesn't and, and there are correct. points where it's not correct you can you know you yeah, can right. find things in there that you know from your own research not to be true but it's very clearly written by someone who was close and that's the tantalizing right. um 
Stephen, there actually is one question that I missed um, from Richard in the chat. And he says, if the Mangan book calls Harrison and George perverted disciples, do you remember hearing anything about your grandfather's sexuality at any point in his life? Or do you think that that is just a rumor ascribed by the Mangum book? I think it's, it, it's, that's a layer that I'll try to answer that really quickly. Yeah, it's a hard question. Um, no one in my family knew about this book. No one in my family. And I was like, wait, he's mentioned in this book. You, none of you knew. And of course, he's not going to um, brag about it. Like, hey, these people are accusing me of this. Uh, after I read it, I was like, oh, wow. And my whole family was like, oh, wow. That, that, that's interesting. Because things started lining up in his life. Uh, my grandpa loved women. He, he loved women. Let's put it that way. However, um, his son... His eldest son, who Liz uh, has dedicated the book to, who he named after William Andrews Clark Jr., uh, he named him Clark, um, was probably gay. He ended up killing himself in the in his 20s because life, George was not, George was very hard on him. And I think that what I have chosen is that I don't think any inappropriateness happened between Mr. Clark and George at least that George was aware of. We also have to remember, sometimes people are not aware what is happening to them is wrong. So, because if he was aware that this was wrong, why would he name his child after Mr. Clark? Why would he have saved these things from, from Mr. Clark? Why, you know, what I choose to believe is that the loss of this man who, who was going to adopt him and who gave him the world was a lot for an 18 year old, a 16, 17, 18 year old. And he had nothing to fall back on. And so once he had, you know, close it all up, move on with life. And then he has a son who starts showing um, effeminate qualities, possibly like Mr. Clark and Harrison, he would beat him. He would literally beat him and and make him, you know, Liz talks a little bit about it in the book. Um, and I think that could very well have been him saying, I do not want happening to you what happened to Clark, uh, Mr. Clark and Harrison Post. You know, I don't want you to go through that. So I choose to believe that inappropriateness didn't really happen, at least on a mass scale that Mangum alleges, uh, because it's actually a better story to think of the layers of hurt and pain that happened to George from losing this godlike figure in his life, as opposed to that pain coming from a sexual assault in a way. You know, that, that storyline doesn't seem to add up with why, why would Martha continue to clean the mausoleum? You know, why would she do all this stuff to sort of still elevate Mr. Clark if he had been violating her child, you know? <laughs> I, I, I don't choose to believe that part of, of manga. Again, were there maybe little instances that people thought or looked like and possibly were? And remember what was inappropriate in 19 whatever may not be inappropriate today. So we can't look at that book with 20, uh, 21 eyes. We have to look at it with those other eyes. Anyway, that's how I felt um, the, the, in a, the, the, the scandal, the really like salacious part of the book. That's how I chose to process it because I know George's story himself outside. People tend to go to the easy explanation. Oh, she was art autistic, or oh, she was uh, molested by her father, or oh, it w this this had an effect on her, or they slot people into their pre-existing caricatures of the monopoly millionaire, or, uh, and uh, people are much more interesting. Stephen says much more interesting because they don't fit in uh, th because these easy explanations are not right. Well, I feel like we're done, everyone. I and mean, there's so much more we could talk about. We could keep talking, I feel like, for another. Maybe hour. we have a part two. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a part two. Maybe we'll be in person one day. 
maybe it will be at the uh, art exhibit where we show this portrait of George <laughs> next to a portrait of Harrison, next to a portrait of Huguette, next to a portrait of Clark Jr. Who knows? Um, but thank you so much, panelists, for being here today. I feel like this has been so many years in the making. I'm yeah. very excited we got to do this, even if it's only virtual. Um, and thank you so much to our audience um, for asking such great questions and being so engaged, um, and to all of my colleagues at the center and the library for all their help today. Um, thank you, Becky. Really thank great. you to the Clark for thank everything you, you've Becky. done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.